Good morning, everybody. Won't you stand to your feet with me so we can give God a great praise? Yep. If you can find it, I need it. God is fighting for us. God is on our side. He is overcome. Yes, He is overcome. We will not be shaken. We will not be moved. Jesus, you are here. Yes, you are.
put your hands together for King Jesus this morning. and generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name is the highest your name is the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all power and positions your name
Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions. Your name stands above them all. Your people will say, Your name is the highest, your name, your name stands above. We believe in your name, all thrones, all powers, and your name stands above. And the angels cry, we sing. That's it. Oh, holy, you will lift it up. Holy, holy forever. Let the people see. Oh, to the king. You will always Holy Good morning. Let's do this. I'm so excited to be here today. All right. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, so when I signed up for that How to Preach class, um, I had no idea that I would be standing up here today. Um, and I kind of wonder if anyone would have signed up for it had they known that that was a possibility. And I just want to say Meredith is not only the most gifted pastor I have ever um, served under in my life, but she's also very crafty, so watch out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, have you ever had a chance to drive a race car on a professional track? If you have, then you know that the first thing you do is you go in and you sign a waiver, and then they put you in this jumpsuit, and they hand you a helmet, and you kind of think, I wonder who last sweated in all this gear. And then they take you into a room where you watch this instructional video of how to stay alive and enjoy the experience. So you listen intently, and then uh, the instructor turns the lights on, and he says, okay, everything you just heard is so important, but remember this. I'll be driving the car in front of you. Keep a close and consistent distance between our cars at all times. Follow me. If you rush up on me, I'm going to have to slow you down to keep you safe. It's really for your own good. And if you back off out of fear, you'll never get the full experience. But don't worry, you won't be alone. Then everyone heads out to the track. It's so loud, you can't hear yourself think. And then you just go, okay, what was the last thing you said? I know it's all very important. And you start to remember every reason why, or think about every reason why you signed that waiver. And you eagerly strap that dirty helmet on your head. And over the roar of all the engines, the instructor says, Remember, stay at a close and consistent pace behind my car at all times. Then he raises his hands over all the drivers. He begins to pray. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but that's what Jesus did the night he left his disciples. And he sent them out onto a dangerous course to advance a kingdom that the world was rejecting. Our message today is out of the book of John. And specifically the prayer that Jesus prayed for his disciples that night in chapter 17. But leading up to that event, the, um, there, there's a lot that's been happening. And I just find it significant that it's the longest prayer recorded that Jesus prayed. I also find it significant that John is the only one who captured it. 
And I think that's special because John is the only one who said he was the self-proclaimed most loved by Jesus. So I think that makes sense that he's the one that captured it because we have a tendency to listen intently to the words of those that we love and trust the most, especially if they're about to go away. It is the longest prayer, but don't worry, we're not covering the whole thing. So leading up to it, the disciples find themselves at the Passover meal with the Passover lamb, but they don't understand that it's the Last Supper. Significant events and words are shared around the table that night. See, this is where Jesus washes his disciples' feet. They're in shock. Why is he doing this? We should wash your feet. What are you doing? It's uncomfortable. It's intimate. It's revealing of how we're supposed to love each other. And at that same meal, Jesus looks at his disciples and says, one of you will betray me. So you go from this incredible intimate experience to what? Who is going to betray you? As Jesus dips the bread and hands it to Judas and says, what you're about to do, do quickly. If you were one of the disciples, what are you thinking? Like, what, what is going on? So if you haven't been listening, you are now. It's a very intense moment. Jesus begins to share even deeper truths. He says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. They say, well, where? How do I get there? And he says, you know the way. I am the way. I don't know about you, but I'd still be asking some more questions. And based on this testimony, it's apparent that they did. I think like a parent who has been answering the question why for three years, Jesus is exhausted at this point. But the questions keep coming because he reveals things. He says, you know, all the miracles that you've witnessed over the last three years, you're going to do greater works than these. What? What, Can you imagine? They've never seen anything like this. The world had never seen anything like this. But you're going to do greater works than these? And he says, oh, and I'm going away. And if I don't go away, I can't send the counselor. And they're like, who's that guy? What is going on? He says that they'll go through a lot of stress, but that they should have joy because he's overcome the world. So all these deep, intimate truths are shared around this table. And there's this breakthrough moment. I love it. You can just imagine three chapters of Q&A. And then the disciples go, you know what? We believe you at last. We get it. I don't think we need to ask you any more questions. And then an exhausted Jesus says, You believe at last, but then he adds one more warning. A time is coming. You'll be scattered, each to your own home. You will leave me all alone, but I won't be alone. The Father is with me. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So you think things are intense now. But what the disciples don't realize is that they're about to journey down the Kidron Valley up to the Mount of Olives, where Jesus is arrested. Peter cuts off the ear of the soldier in defense of his king, who he then denies three times. And then Jesus is taken. And a lot of difficult things happen. And... um, then the cross happens, and it looks like pure failure. So if you're one of the disciples, what are you thinking? In this passage, we're going to start on verse 9. So if you are actually verse 6, if you want to read along with me, He says, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. I want you to imagine what's happening here. The disciples have experienced washing their feet. Judas left. They don't really know why. What is going on? All these perplexing truths. And then all of a sudden, Jesus starts praying for them. So he's saying things that he has just said in the previous chapters, but he's repeating them. Why is Jesus repeating them? It's not because the Father needs to know. The Father knows. Jesus knows. It's for them. And this 
this passage was also, this prayer was also written for us today. So as you hear these words, think about what he's repeating and wonder why. So he says, I have, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. I mean, they just said that in the previous verse. So he's repeating this. They get it. They get it. And he's saying, disciples, don't forget that you get it. Like a good parent, just repeating things. They know everything that I have is, is, it comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. Now I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. See, I'll remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. And I'm coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by the name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, that the scripture would be fulfilled. Here again, he repeats, I'm coming to you now. He's like, disciples, I'm leaving you. Father, I'm coming to you. But I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I've given them your word and the world has hated them for they are not of this world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them, I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. So Jesus is praying aloud because he wants the disciples to hear him, and he repeats the things that he's already said so that they will remember because Jesus knows what's happening next and they may perceive it, but they're denying it. No one would want to walk into the lives that they were about to walk into. And these words were very important. So one of the concepts that really came alive in this passage for me the first time is the disciples were formed by God for God. He kept saying, these are the ones that you gave to me. So I pondered that. He's not praying for the whole world. He's just praying for the ones that were given to him. And he's also praying for us today, the ones who would believe through this message. So the disciples were formed by God for God. So we are formed by God and for God, not of this world for this world. So when I was a child, I was formed by me for me. I was a normal, self-centered kid. But when I turned seven years old, I accepted Christ as my Savior, and I began to memorize Scripture. And because I thought I could do anything, and my problem is still I want to do everything, <laughs> Philippians 4.13 was empowering to me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I thought this Christianity thing is really cool. I was formed by me for God. I thought I had it figured out. But did Jesus come with his own agenda? No. He didn't even speak the words that his mind wanted to speak. He spoke only what the Father gave him. And he repeated that. It's captured in testimony, even outside the word of God. So why do we expect our lives to be any different? Why do I think I can create my own agenda and just ask him to bless it? Jesus didn't do that. So I was formed by God for God, and I struggle to get out of his way every day. So we are formed by God for God. And in verse 18, Jesus says to the Father, as you have sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. And by the testimony of these disciples over 2,000 years ago, here we are. What if they had said, nah, it's too much. What if Peter had stayed in that place of denial and not come back? What would the church look like today? Would there be a church? So they're all sent out on these missions that are dangerous, uncomfortable, 
not their own agenda. So we are sent into this world just like they were sent into the world. Why? To give God glory. So here's the big question. How? How did Jesus give the Father glory? In the earlier part of this prayer, the answer is found there. Jesus reveals the answer by saying, Father, I have brought glory to you by completing the work you gave me to do. So that's it. That's how we give him glory. Think about what he prays for his disciples. He has warned them, and now he's praying for them. And what does he pray for them? I'll tell you, if I were rewriting this before Jesus prayed this prayer, I'm like, can you just ask that we would be taken out of this world with you? That is not what he does. He says, I'm leaving them in this world, and I'm sending them out on dangerous courses, and they're going to need some things. So what do they need? They need protection and strength. They need protection on the outside, and they need strength on the inside. So let's look at those verses. So he says, I'm coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name. The name that you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. So think about the significance of that. Jesus is leaving his trusted disciples entrusting them to carry the church forward to spread throughout the world. And he says they're going to need protection, and what's the one thing he prays for them? That they would be protected by the name. So as I was pondering that, I thought, you know, whether you believe that the name of Jesus is a protection for you or not, the spiritual realm knows what the name of Jesus means. The enemy knows the power of the name of Jesus. So if you're in a place where you need a little protection, a little clarity, a little help, try saying the name Jesus. And whether you believe it or not, I promise you that in the spiritual realm all around us, it was heard. And it has impact. If you could leave two things with your disciples right before you leave, and this is one of them, it's very significant. So the second thing he prays for them is strength. And if you're following along, he doesn't use the word strength in these passages. But he prays strength for them because he says, I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. What is that? protection on the outside by the power of the name that all of the universe recognizes, whether they believe it or not, and inner strength through the full measure of my joy. Let's talk about that. Why is having the full measure of the joy of Christ within you the strength that we need to continue on the dangerous course? Because it takes strength to go from fear to faith. It takes strength to say, I trust you and not what my eyes see. It takes strength to get a bad diagnosis and smile and trust God. It takes strength to walk out with a box in your hands because you've been laid off and say, this is not a good day, not what I expected, but I trust you. It takes strength to get a summons to trial and say, Lord, I trust you. So the the Lord asked for two things for them, protection and strength. Was it an easy mission he was sending them out on? No. Why do we expect our lives to be any different Have you been hit season after season after season? And you're like, can we get a break here? Looks like you've been leaving that family alone. (laughs) 
Why do we expect our lives to be any different? If you read about what happens to the disciples after that, it was a hard course, but they stayed in it. They stayed at a close, consistent pace. They followed him. And so we're just asked to do the same thing. Simple, right? When we're called to do things that we know God guided us to do, but it gets hard, why do we want to abandon the mission? You got any people in your lives that say, I would, just, I would just move. I would just get divorced. I would just say, no, I'm not doing that. No, thank you. I wouldn't take on that burden. Think about what the world tells us. But the Lord invites us on to missions that are frightening, where it requires the protection and the strength. So if you're in a place where you don't feel a little uneasy, you might want to go back and rethink, why am I here? What am I doing? Is this the calling on my life? Did I avoid something that looked hard or dangerous? So we have a tendency to avoid the things that look really tough because life can be hard already. Because we often lose the strength to believe on the inside when things look broken on the outside. That's why we want to give up the mission. It looks like it's failing. So how do you find joy when that happens? Here's my answer. Look, God has asked me to do several things in my life. I can look back and go, okay, that was definitely him. And it, was, it went really well. But I have a lot more stories that were definitely him. And it didn't go really well. And when that happens, I question myself, like, why am I doing this? And so I go back to my journal where I record. When I really believe he's telling me this is what you're supposed to do next, I write it down because I'm like, okay, are you sure? And so I'll go back to that journal when things start to look broken all around. And here's how our conversation goes. Um, I know this was your idea and not mine. So what are you going to do about it? The cross didn't look like a good plan, did it? but he worked it all out. So invite me into whatever you will for my life, whether I think it's going to work out the way I think you think it should work out or not, I trust you. And you know something? When you stop playing God of your own life, something happens. There's freedom. When you get into a hard place and the world says, ooh, you really ought to shut that down. Ooh, maybe you shouldn't have gone there. But you know what? You can always go back. When you get to those tough places, the world teaches you to figure it out. But when you stop trying to figure it out and you just go back to that journal entry and say, look, I thought it was crazy then. It looks really bad now. I'm just going to let you do it ever it is that you knew you were doing in the first place. That's freedom. That is freedom. And with freedom, there's joy. There's the full measure of the joy of the Lord. And when you taste that, it can continue to look broken all around you. And you can smile. And you can have joy. I can be like a little girl outside on a hot summer day with a popsicle. And my biggest concern is eating that popsicle before the sun melts it. That is freedom. And you can have that right in the middle of any tough place that the Lord invites you into. So what's concerning you most today? Just take a minute and think about that. We are formed by God for God. We're sent into the world to complete good works, face opposition with the full measure of the joy of Christ which gives glory to the Father. I got a really bad diagnosis in January, breast cancer. Some of you know, most of you don't. I smiled all the way through it because, you know, I knew that God was with me. And he was putting this word on my heart. So I'm like, Lord, what does it look like today to be a little girl with a popsicle just trying to race the sun? And to not worry about what tomorrow looks like. He has indeed delivered me from it, not the way I wanted him to, 
but I'm cancer-free today, in case you were worried about that. It wasn't without a journey, but he was faithful the whole way. And it was just another test in life to trust him. And I'm really grateful to be standing here today. I have this note that says, I'm saved to serve. So like, if you're nervous, get over it. You could be dead right now. I'm not. I'm here. (laughs) Seriously. (laughs) So how do we know what our good works are? That answer is also found in the Word, several places. But Ephesians 2.10 says, We are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which are prepared in advance for us to do by God. So who prepared the work? God did. Who created the course of our lives? God did. So who are we looking to to figure out what our work is? We should be looking to him for it, right? Right? Sounds simple. But what's the key? We have to keep a close and consistent pace between our cars at all times. So driving a race car is like walking with Christ. No one makes you get in that car. But you know there's something special. You want that adventure. No one makes you follow. It's an invitation. Don't you know when you think you're following and then you know, okay, I'm really not following. (laughs) Sometimes I slow down and there's just a little too much distance and then I can feel it. Peter denied him three times. Just say, I'm sorry. I'm going to trust you more. Get a little closer. And sometimes when we think we know what it looks like, that he is doing in our lives, we just race ahead. We're like, I knew you were going to make that a successful thing. And you zoom ahead, and sometimes you fly off the cliff. And the problem with that is that whatever it was that he wanted to show you, he may have also wanted to show him through you to many others. So that's the danger of racing ahead. What's the typical shape of a racetrack? Goes round and round, lots of turns. There was a Q&A session after the video instructions at Texas Motor Speedway that day. And I said, um, I go, hey, uh, am I strong enough to turn the steering wheel to make the turns at such high speeds? And he said, drive straight. The course actually turns you. See, oval tracks mimic a straight road because of the banked turns that allow the driver to take it flat out. But going into a turn at over 100 miles per hour (laughs) without turning the wheel is a peculiar experience. This is often what it feels like to follow Christ. To complete a peculiar work prepared in advance just for me, just for you. How do we find that work? Keep a close and consistent distance between our cars at all times. He says, follow me. So if you'll join me in prayer. (sighs) Heavenly Father, help us to keep a close and consistent distance between our cars at all times. Remind us that the instructions are the same no matter how the course changes. Forgive us when we're turning the wheel and going off course. Thank you for always inviting us back through the blood of the perfect Passover lamb, Jesus Christ. A course that looked broken, made beautiful for us. Open our spiritual eyes to see you right before us. Give us the strength to keep our eyes on you. Give us the courage to follow you anywhere. And in this moment, Holy Spirit, I just ask you to remind each person in this room of something that is giving them great concern. Maybe it's that one thing in your life where you say, you know what, if if we could just figure that out, I'd be so much happier. Or hey, wouldn't life be easier if this were different? Why do we have to carry this burden? Are you sure? What are those things Holy Spirit, I just ask that you let the words fall into each of their lives. Follow me, not what you see. 
I am always before you. Don't turn the wheel. The world is going to get loud and frightening and you will feel out of control, but don't turn the wheel. Turns on the track come up again and again. Don't turn the wheel. Follow me and enjoy the ride. It's the only place you'll find true joy. In the powerful and perfect name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Brandy. This is a time in our service that we call the offering at Westminster. Um, oftentimes, offering used to be passing around a collection plate. We don't do that anymore. If you'd like to make an offering like that, there's a clear box in the back. But what we try to do for our offering time is really spend two to three minutes asking God to tell us what it looks like for us to offer ourselves up to Him this week. And so you can come down and pray at the altar, or you can um, stay in your seat. But I encourage you to really listen to the Lord today from what Brandy said and from what God wants to tell you that he wants to use your gifts and your talents and your service this week. Um, so let's enjoy it.
take me deep and then my feet could ever wander and my faith be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without water. Me walk upon the water wherever you call me. Take me deeper than my feet. My faith will be made strong be seated. I just have a couple of announcements, probably more than a couple. The first one I meant to say earlier, um, this past week, you're going to, if you walk into that building after this, um, you'll notice that there's some construction going on. We had a leak um, in of a pipe and you, it was like tiny little spot the guy showed us and you would not believe how much water can come out of that tiny little hole. He said the pressure was insane and so I mean, Meredith's office, the children's ministry office, the hallway, part of the fellowship hall, all was like soaked in water and the ceiling. So we had to have all that removed. So we're in the middle of remediation in there. You can totally go walk through, but just so you didn't wonder what we were doing, that was it. Um, if you were in Sunday school, like in the adult class that, that Vince teaches, it's going to be meeting in A109 today because of our remediation. Um, but other announcements, much funner. Um, we have uh, a water Wednesday. Oh, okay. This one's a good one. Um, let's go back. Y'all got my passion coming out already. Um, guys, right here. And if you'll see that little QR code right there, I'd love for you to take your phones out and take a picture because this is our leadership for the pumpkin patch. We need volunteers to be on leadership. The only way we can do this pumpkin patch is if people help. And the way we've broken down leadership last year and this year has really made it a lot easier because it's much smaller jobs. So if everybody steps in and does a much smaller job, that makes it all happen. So if you've been to Pumpkin Patch and love it, we'd love for you to step into some leadership roles. Um, next, we have Wacky Water Wednesday on Wednesday, this Wednesday, I think at 9 o'clock um, for, for families with their children here at the church. And then... 
Millie and her ministry is doing a mission project called Soul Hope. They cut out uh, blue jeans, like a shoe, like a pattern of a blue jean, uh, of a shoe, onto blue jeans. They send it into that ministry, and then that ministry makes shoes for people in world and parts of the world that don't have shoes. So they'll be doing that on that date. And Millie invited anyone who else who wants to join besides her class are welcome to come. Um, Westminster is having a new to Westminster. If you've been wanting to learn more about Westminster or been here forever and have still never joined, we'd love for you to come on August 6th in between services. And what I love about it is if you really wanted to join the church but you never want to walk up to the front because it's a, you're not comfortable being up front, you actually can join the church at this lunch or breakfast. It's kind of like a brunch. Um, I don't know what that is. But one other meeting, I thought there was another one. We are still collecting juice boxes for, um, for uh, kids, kids' lunch. Oh, it's up there, yay. So we're still collecting those juice boxes and I have quite a few in the, in the, um, in the office. So if you wanna bring them or you can just buy them and they send them straight to them, which is really nice. Lastly, we start our youth mission trip next Sunday. Um, we are actually hosting a VBS for immigrant children here at the church, and our youth will be running that. And we really wanted to send each of those children home with a little pencil box with a bunch of school supplies in it. And so if you would love to bring some school supplies up here so we can stuff those little pencil boxes with as many school supplies as we can, if we get more than enough, we'll give them to CCSC for their school supply drive, so it will get used well. Um, but basic things like the small deal of crayons or the small deal of um, uh colored pencils, pink, ra pink erasers, things like that. So um, join us with that. It'll be fun. And we just need lots of prayers because our youth are um, going to have 20-something little kids here. So um, we all need lots of prayers. So I'm going to close this in our benediction, if you'll stand for the benediction. Go now knowing that you are made by God and you are made for God. Allow God to shine through you in everything you do this week. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.